Right, hello and welcome back to the Boxing Index podcast. I'm back again with Jago because last time he came on I got over 500 views, so he's back. I was just going to say it's very optimistic of you to be saying welcome back as if anyone's returning. (laughs) (laughs) As if we've got people out there who are just like waiting for the next Boxing Index. And if you are out there and you love last podcast and you're waiting for the next episode to drop and this is an exciting moment for you, I've got to say, get a fucking life, honestly. Uh, Actually, my dad listens every week. (laughs) I'm not even sure that's true. (laughs) He tells me he does and I'm like, what do you think of this? And he goes, oh yeah. And I'm like, that wasn't even in it. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're uh, just over a week on from the, or almost two weeks on from the White Povetkin fight, which was our last podcast, so we're going to go over the fallout from that a bit. Um, how's the dust settled with you, Jager? Dust is settled very well, mate, have to say. Uh, actually, that, that's a complete f- full out lie. Um, I've been very annoyed by a lot of the commentary afterwards, as I'm sure you have. I, we all found the Dillian White, Frank Warren exchange is very amusing, I think. Um, on both sides, I mean, Uncle Frank did come back with an absolute zinger. I'm not sure he had it in his locker. Um, but I think that the criticism that has been levelled at Dillian White on a number of levels for taking that fight is just frustrating as a fan and also very hypocritical in that that is the one fight, he is the one fighter that has consistently taken any fight uh, that has been you know, put his way, has, has taken risks in this case, but also in his previous fights, you know, against uh, Parker um, and also Rivas, where he didn't have to take those. I mean, Parker, you could argue, was instrumental to kind of elevating him to becoming part of the top four. I'm not sure if he was an out-and-out that, that we would be talking about the top four in the way we are had he not beaten Parker. But the Rivas fight and this fight just demonstrates him taking risks in difficult fights where he doesn't need to. Need to. And uh, he loses and suddenly everyone's laughing at him. And the, the point should be, and I think this is the point that he's been raising over the past 24 months, is that if you're an elite level fighter and you fight consistently other elite level fighters, anyone on their day can beat you. And that's all that's happened to him. So he, he suggests that you know, if you had a league, in the same way in other sports, football, whatever, um, when the top teams play each other, there's not always, you know, over the course of the league, over five or six years, they all get victories against each other. Even lower teams beat higher up teams. And so he, when you're consistently fighting the best, it's common that you're going to, you know, lose once in a while. And that's why we will pray, say, a fighter such as Lennox Lewis it, for the fact that he avenged every single loss in his career. But he still had losses against McCall and Ratman. And Ratman arguably is only a name because he beat Lennox Lewis. So I, I just think it's silly the level of criticism he's got for uh, taking a loss. Sorry, I know it's been a long yeah. answer, but... You know, well, yeah, I th- yeah, I think there's a couple of points you brought up there. I think the, the Parker one's an interesting one that I've always thought about, because, yeah, I do think, I agree with you, that that elevated his status, but um, obviously just before he took the Parker fight, he was um, called by the WBC to fight Luis Ortiz, and then they said that was a final eliminator, similarly to the Rivas fight. And instead, he went and took the Park fight because Park was a bigger name in the UK, pay per view numbers, all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm guessing that's why he took it. Um, so yeah, that was maybe like not his best decision. I, I like the fact that he fights people, like good people all the time. But I think Ortiz would have been just as good an option, even not a better option. But in America, maybe not in England. Uh, um, and then yeah, just a couple other points from that. What you just said. That's I mean, you're just talking about classic hindsight fans. They love it. Like they're all before it. All of the talk was. Povetkin, why is he fighting a 40-year-old? Joshua's already beat him, pointless, pointless. Then it goes, oh, why is he taking that fight? That was too big a risk. And all the chatter just switches from one end to another. Um, but yeah, as you were saying with the whole fighting the best and, and how it happens in football, I think that's where all boxing really needs is a governing body, an overriding governing body, because one of the things that does make it interesting is the separate promotions and broadcasters and belts and all those kind of things but in those kind of situations there's no overriding governing body that's going to be able to put together any kind of system where the best are going to fight the best or where things that should happen happen it's all just a free-for-all wild west basically um anyway yeah you look like you had something to say (laughs) no i was just going to say well to take it back, I completely agree with that about your overarching governing body. Mine was just on a conceptual level. That if you had a system 
and this has been Dinny and White's point, he's like, I will fight anyone. And he, he said, I remember watching multiple interviews with him 18 months plus ago, he said, if I fought the four or five best fighters in the world three times each, he was like, we'll, we'll, I'll lose a couple, they'll lose a couple. My point being that in football, when we see the best teams play each other twice a season at least, you know, it's very common that it, all of the best teams have some wins, some losses. And we just accept that it's part and parcel of the fact that they're competing at the elite level. It's, you know, over four or five seasons, you're ne never going to have Man City beat all of the other, um, you know, top six home and away. Mm -hmm. We just accept that on a conceptual level, you're going to win some and lose some. And he's the closest to being in that kind of status where he's fighting the top. And it should, it, you know, I agree with him. His point is this whole protecting your zero losses is valuable. He's like, well, no, it shouldn't. If you're taking the right fights, you shouldn't have a zero. Yeah. Like, you're going to lose one at some point. And to, I think to your point, I mean, that's where in America you're seeing the rise, uh, revenue-wise and also um, viewing-wise, of the UFC is fast yeah, approaching just, overtaking yeah, boxing. Yeah. Because you have Dana White, don't fuck about, and he's going to make the fight, yeah, and you're mandated to fight, and if yeah. you don't, you vacate your belt. The thing that I was going to ask you was just about, going back to the point about Parker, you said it wasn't the best, um, maybe, decision. Obviously, Frank Warren came out after the loss and said that Dillian White had been failed by Matchroom because for 500 of the days, and I'm paraphrasing here, but for 500 of the 1,000 days that um, you know, he was mandatory, Fury was sat in a pub not training and he got um, Fury the wilder fight within 200 days of returning I was just going to ask because you know when you were talking about the park and being pay-per-view we don't know the extent to which that might have been guidance given from Eddie Hearn but I was going to ask your opinion on do you think there is some truth that maybe Eddie Hearn has failed him if not in getting the um, why, uh, sorry, the, the Wilder fight just generally with some of the decisions he's made maybe the Parker fight was a decision that Eddie Hearn pushed him towards Yeah, well, I think the um, I think Eddie Hearn was always going to struggle in terms of managing White just because, or promoting White because of the fact that he had Joshua you're always going to struggle because the heavyweight division is the glamour division you're always going to struggle when you have a top level heavyweight but then you have another top level heavyweight who you see as better or more marketable or whatever. And so uh, White was always gonna suffer from that perspective because if any decision could be made that would benefit Joshua and it might have an adverse effect on White's career, then Eddie Helm was gonna take that because Joshua is the golden boy of matchroom boxing. And I think that's almost fair enough. I mean, White came to him later. Joshua is, does drive num numbers more than Dillian White. But yeah, I do think in the, in the terms of that fight for the, for, with Parker, um, obviously I don't know the ins and outs of it behind the scenes, but I do think it was strange for White to take the decision to fight Parker, and uh, it might have something to do with the fact that Parker is obviously signed with Matchroom, so that's a double whammy for them. They get, they get paid on both ends of that. Whereas if he then fights Ortiz, is Ortiz uh, promoted by PBC? I think so. I think so, yeah. And obviously, like... Al Heyman's one of the best promoters out there. He's obviously managed some of the best fighters in the world. But I think Eddie Hearn probably saw that as a bit of a headache, trying to get that fight done. And with the influence that Al Heyman has and the numbers that he knows he can do in America that Eddie Hearn can't match up to, um, I imagine that Eddie Hearn probably thought if I put White in with Ortiz... Like, yeah, maybe he try and get some sort of joint promotion going, but I imagine Al Heyman takes the reins on that. I think as well, it, it speaks to a brilliant article that went up on Boxing Index today, talking about the extent to which egos are ruining business. Uh, sorry, ruining boxing for the fans. And I think the factor that comes into there, um, that is discussed slightly in the article, is maybe, if not egos, business. That there's a clear business side to things. Mm -hmm. And so Eddie Hearn's interests are always going to be in protecting the matter and revenue, etc. Um, and so that very clearly <coughs> might have motivated uh, any advice that Dillian White has given, any figures that Dillian White has given. I mean, and, and that's not criticism on Eddie Hearn, it's the same as everyone. The bottom line is the need to make the revenue. But there's a clear business competition in the sense of Eddie Hearn would obviously rather have White fight, and this was before the launch, um, the actual launch of the zone. 
I believe, before the convention mm. to Moapa. I think the deal was being signed around that point, but it definitely hadn't launched. So he clearly has a business preference. Well, yeah, thanks for uh, shouting out my article I posted today. If you want to go check it out, it's on the Boxing Index. It's about um, whether egos are hindering boxing. Um, yeah, so I think you can obviously raise questions over um, Eddie Hearns dealing with Dillian White, and whenever somebody waits that long for a mandatory position, whether it's in their hands or not, you're going to ask questions, because there were things that could have been done before that to have that mandatory position called earlier. And obviously now it's gone down the shitter, which, which is, I've got another article in the Boxing Index about delays and uh, how delays just seem to fuck everyone over in boxing like they have with, they did with the Joshua Wilder fight. You remember when that was like the biggest talk on everyone's lips? Um, but I think you can't have too much regard at Eddie Hearn just because Didion White is earning, like he, he's one of the only pay-per-view, pay-per-view stars do not come around often in boxing. And I think we almost take take it for advantage in England a little bit because we do have quite a few at the moment who can, if they're in the right fights, be on pay-per-views. But Dillian White's one of those guys where obviously he needs a competitive opponent. But like he had Oscar Rivas, who wasn't, he was good, a very good fighter, but he wasn't that well known. And that was a pay-per-view. And uh, Eddie Hearn's done such a good job of marketing Dillian that he just didn't have before that. And I don't know whether Frank, because obviously the, the, uh, marketing power of Queensbury promotion like just isn't really on that level there's so many great fighters that Queensbury have that so many people just don't know about like Hamza Shearer's for example how many people know in that super welterweight division in England about Anthony Fowler Scott Fitzgerald Ted Cheeseman all of those guys I think Ham I personally think Hamza Shearer's is a level above all those guys and he's probably less well known uh, yeah no I completely agree um, and I think it's obviously an easy kind of recourse and you know Warren is a competitor. I was just interested on your kind of a, a take on it. Yeah. Um, and um, again, it probably goes goes back to the hindsight point. It's very easy for Uncle Frank to say that, but yeah. the extent to which he even was able, it, the extent to which it was him that got Fury that Wilder deal, mm. none of us know. I mean, Eddie Hearn keeps claiming that he's been told specifically not to deal with Frank <laughs> over uh, with regards to Tyson Fury. Yeah. So. Uh, I personally agree with you. I think it's um, positioning and uh, kind of rhetoric from Frank, which, I mean, is the right business move to be doing, but I, I can't see that there's a lot of truth behind it. Because Dillian White, the fact of the matter is, is imagine after that loss to Joshua, Dillian White had a sign with Queensbury. I know he never signed with Matchroom after the loss. He had kind of three fight deals, etc., for a long time. But imagine he'd, say, allied himself with Queensbury. Mm. Is there any conceivable way that he would be as big a household name or have as much money as he does now? Yeah, well, no. just, just for starters, who would he have fought? Because if you look at the matchroom heavyweight stable, especially because what Eddie Hearn's done well is by building up European heavyweight talent almost through fighting Joshua or through speculation of fighting Joshua. Like, your name can grow so much just through the fact that you fought or might be fighting Anthony Joshua. And he's done that with the likes of Povetkin, Parker, all those guys. And then they've built this name in the UK and respect. And then he's gone on and given them to Dillian White. And that, and that creates a bigger fight there. Absolutely. And I think as well, like you say, I mean, you touch on the matchroom stable is across all the weight divisions is incredible. Um, in terms of not just their world level or European level, but the domestic level. I, I think as a fan, personally, we're talking about heavyweights only, as say the glamour division. I'm excited for the potential of some domestic level fights we can have. I don't think we've ever seen heavyweights of this quality, or at least the number of heavyweights of this quality fighting at domestic level. And bar Dubois and Joyce, who you might say are um, a level above domestic level but ultimately are, are still fighting for the British heavyweight title when they fight each other mm. so must be classed at every single one of them of that kind of domestic level fighter is signed at matchroom yeah I mean, you almost feel sorry for someone like Dave Allen because obviously he's coming along saying all I want is a British title that's like my aim and he's coming along in like maybe one of the hardest eras because <laughs> obviously like this isn't definitely isn't one of the best eras heavyweight wise it, world on the global stage but I would say domestically, it's definitely up there. I mean, you've got, you've, obviously you've got Lennox Lewis, but I mean, before that, people like Frank Bruno were like the number one guys, and obviously he wasn't like the biggest heavyweight in the world. 
Yeah. The main talking point since the fallout of that fight has been whether it's brought the uh, Joshua Fury fight any closer, because obviously why it was meant to be the mandatory. Um, do you think we're any closer to it? I think all the signs are that it's an obstacle that's been removed, right, instead of us necessarily being any closer to it. So it was something that was hypothetically in the way. But ultimately, I mean, aside from the fact that they're both contracted to um, fight uh, respective fights before that, I mean, Eddie Holmes come out during the week and made an interesting point saying that Fury is tied in on a contractual level more than Joshua. And as I read into his comments, actually he's hinting, well, he says so explicitly, that Joshua wants to keep all the belts but if he feels that he's being held ransom, this is exact, you know, an exact quote, is that if he's being held ransom by a governing body or a fighter, he's more than willing to drop the belt. And Eddie Holmes come out and said that the fans' interest is in seeing the Fury Joshua fight as opposed to seeing an undisputed fight, which I'm not sure I agree with. But it's that there were very clear hints there that Joshua would be willing to drop a belt um, and that his clear desire is to f have the Fury fight, and that if he can do it for the undisputed, of course they will. But, I mean, also, my point being that that could be an argument against the fact that um, Joshua is tied in contractually, but Fury definitely is tied in contractually. Mm -hmm. If they want it to be for the undisputed, which in a business sense, I think it's so much more marketable if it is for the undisputed, because we haven't seen that in so many years, or at least a competitive fight for that in so many years, then, uh, I mean, Lennox Lewis was the last undisputed. Um, then uh, the Joshua has the Pulev fight. And I, I think that so much of it is unpredictable because that will be, like, accepting that the heavyweight is the glamour division and it, uh, ultimately is the most marketable division, has got to be the biggest fight in at least a decade. I mean, you can put some others up there, Pacquiao, Mayweather, but, I mean, this is a huge, huge fight. And so they're going to want it to be for the undisputed. They're going to want it to be in front of fans because the amount of money you can charge or the amount of money Saudi Arabia is going to pay to host, or, you know, or Dubai would host, pay to host that. So I think it's an obstacle removed, but are we close to that fight? My opinion is no, because they're going to want it to be for undisputed and in front of fans, which means there's still a load of hurdles to get through. Yeah, I think definitely, they definitely need the gate. Because you can't have that fight without fans there, and uh, and I even think like I know it's probably going to end up being in Saudi Arabia or something like that. But we've had so much from Eddie Hearn recently about the reason why post lockdown fights are working, but they're not like ultimately profitable. He said is the gate and the fact that there's no atmosphere. He said that the the main thing that he enjoys in boxing is watching the buzz, the atmosphere, all that kind of stuff. You're not going to get that in Saudi Arabia. So, and then, uh, yeah, just one other thing was, um, yeah, you're saying that you, that you need the undisputed. I'm not sure I completely agree with that because I think where the big money is in this fight is the casual fans because the, the hardcore boxing fans are going to watch that no matter what. It, they could literally do the worst marketing in the world and they're going to watch that. It's the casual fans is where that money is coming from. And I think almost one of the turnoffs from boxing is all the complication with belts and stuff like that for a casual fan. And so I think that it not being undisputed won't be that much of an issue. I think as long as there are belts involved so they can be called the heavyweight champion in the world and that kind of stuff, it just has that nicer ring to it. Um, but and I, obviously undisputed is like a good thing to be able to say, but I don't think numbers-wise that particularly would affect it. So I think I disagree with you on both of those points. I think the first point about Saudi Arabia, I completely understand, but ultimately Eddie Hearns a salesman and the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at the amount of money that's coming from uh, the Far East or Middle East um, a, a number of countries Dubai Saudi Arabia even Singapore are pouring into hosting sporting events that's something that can't be replicated on game figures mm -hmm. so Saudi Arabia themselves will pay an extraordinary amount of money on top of it, which is separate to the amount of money you're going to get you're going to charge for the gate, which is going to be higher there because it will be uh, kind of it's almost exclusively businessmen, and then on top on top of pay per view. So we're talking tens of millions of pounds extra, mm -hmm. if not hundreds of millions of pounds extra, you gain from hosting 
in, in, in a Saudi Arabia or Dubai. Yeah, if, if, if they did a trilogy, do you think at least one should be in the UK? Just so we, because I, I, I completely see your point there and I agree with it. The, if you're offering someone 150 million to fight in Saudi Arabia or 50 million to fight here, then it's, it's a pretty obvious choice. I know what we'd all pick. But do you think maybe one should be here just, just for the legacy making? They've made their 300 million from the first two. I mean, obvious, the obvious answer we want to hear is fantasy. Yeah. Yes, but <laughs> whether, again, it's like betting on. The only thing that's, I think, uh, less predictable than betting on COVID is betting on Tyson Fury. I mean, if he does Joshua, <laughs> can we bet that he wants to do another one? Yeah. I mean, he might want to do it in the car park. And but that's the kind of thing that he'd stipulate, is that let's do it in a UK car park. <laughs> uh, I think the second point you raised was about undisputed. And I would argue that actually it's the opposite way around. So I agree with you, the big money's in the casual fans. But your point was that you think the purest boxing fans, at least as I understood it, are the ones that would care about Undisputed. And for the casual fans, they wouldn't. I'd say it's the other one. I think as an out and out boxing fans, they're the ones that are, would be like, okay, it's cool to see it for the Undisputed. Mm. Uh, but we just want to see Fury and Joshua get on. For the casual fan, the commercial value, I believe, in being able to label that as Undisputed and to be able to market it as being from the first to crown the first undisputed heavyweight champion since Lennox Lewis in 30, 40 years, whatever, you know, how, however long it's been now. And to be able to kind of purely market it based on factors, this is for, this is the guy that holds one belt versus, but coming from a standpoint of, imagine someone that knows nothing about boxing, it's like heavyweights, the biggest guys, the, the guy that holds one belt versus the guy that holds three, to unify everything to become the best fighter in the world. Like, on a very simple marketing level for someone that has no interest in boxing. I mean, even saying those words, it sounds like a WWE yeah. intro, right? <laughs> it doesn't sound, but that is what's gonna appeal to the fan. And I definitely think that any commercial analysis would believe that you're gonna add value to it for it being undisputed. Yeah, I, uh, I guess, yeah, I see your point in that. It almost has that UFC thing of, one name, one champion, all that kind of stuff. Well, Wilder always used to say, now, unfortunately <laughs> for him, he's probably not going to be involved. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the other big things that's come out of this is, so obviously with White losing, that takes out the... Because uh, if they both got their first, well, not mandatory, it's con contractual fights. I guess for Joshua it's a mandatory, but it's also contracted. So, yeah, you got the Pulev, the Wilder. Then after that was going to come White, Usyk, and then we were going to be able to make this fight. Um... Why are you looking at No, no, as in white for Fury and Usyk oh, for Joshua. Um, the, uh, what I have seen said is that because, um, and this is sort of going back to the whole undisputed thing, because white is out of the way, the risk for Joshua fighting Usyk, when he's a bit of an unknown entity at, at heavyweight, he could be better. No, nobody knows. Like Eddie Hearn cannot say that Joshua definitely wins that fight because nobody knows, because nobody really knows what Usyk can do at heavyweight yet. And, um, and that might just be too much of a risk to that undisputed fight, or not undisputed, that Fury-Joshua fight, because it does take marketability off it if he loses to Usyk. Um, and so they were saying, obviously, they might vacate that WBO belt and, uh, and just go for the fight. And then Usyk is the number one challenger. Daniel Dubois has recently been named in the rankings the number two challenger, despite having not fought. I get that he's one of the brightest talents in the heavyweight division. He's like meant to be the guy. He's got the same kind of hype that Joshua had coming up. But to not have fought anyone in the WBL's top 10 rankings, and then to be placed number two, really confuses me. What do you think of that? Obviously it's confusing, but I mean, <laughs> I think anyone that's followed boxing for any period of time understands that it's probably one of the least confusing aspects of boxing. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we all watch fights. Um, and, I mean, I'm, I'm used to watching fights and arguing with people who I'm watching with because uh, everyone I seem to be friends with is argumentative. And I'm quite <laughs> passive and they always draw me in. Um, and, and literally everyone in the world is argumentative other than me and I just respond. Um, but and, and sometimes, I mean, the judges obviously have 
clearly been watching different fights, not only to me, but to each other. So I think it's, you know, it's one of those things where obviously it's completely ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I think the WBO are seeing money signs, aren't they? That big commission for the Usyk Dubois fight. I mean, absolutely. But is it ridiculous? Yes. Is it surprising? On a level of things that surprise me in boxing, it's probably at a three mm. out of ten. I mean, it's, it's a good fight, but for him to leapfrog Joseph Parker, I just find so, so weird. Because you sick Joseph Parker's a great fight as well. I don't know if it's more marketable, but it's a great fight. And uh, it, exactly, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a casual fan, but it's a, um, I, I personally think for people that invest in boxing, I'd rather see the Parker fight first, mm. because they're closer in age. Yeah. They're closer in state, because Parker's 26, right? Uh, um, 28? I'm not, late, mid to late 20s. I th- yeah, I, I was yeah. under the impression he's 26. Yeah. Uh, and so still has a lot of, you know, he was uh, a champion at a relatively young age and still has a lot of kind of mileage in the tank. And that if we're looking at the future, like you say, Usyk's unproven, uh, but has, you know, is much closer in terms of the next generation than, uh, he's, he's much closer to the world. I think if we were going to pick out two names that we take in five or six years, once we've seen the back of Fury, Wilder and uh, Joshua, and even White, who are, who are gone, who are, who are the next two leading lights, it's going to be Dubois and Parker. Yeah. And so that would be, that, I anticipate that almost being a rivalry in the long run. Mm. And I, I think from a purist standpoint, I don't know again about the casual fan, but I would assume that that would be a kind of bigger, more interesting fight than Usyk. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree with that. Those two definitely seem like they will be leading the way for the next generation. Yeah, because Parker came into the scene quite early. Um, <clears throat> another one's obviously Hergovic. He'll sort of, I imagine he'll get in the mix. Um, just quickly before we move on from heavyweights, obviously, I think in the last month or month and a half, David Adelaide, the young British heavyweight, he's another up-and-coming guy, um, has fought twice. A lot of people are saying he's too small to be a heavyweight, but he does move really well. Um, like, what, what do you? I know he's only had three, four fights. Or I think three. I think he's three and zero. Oh. Um, what do you sort of see as his chances going forward? I think a lot of it does depend on who is at the top of the heavyweight scene. So the argument about him being too small comes down to uh, with with the current fighters who are you know the top three. <clears throat> Or at least the top two and the height, the, the respective heights of Fury and Joshua. And ultimately, you can draw a parallel with Usyk about mm. Usyk's chances. You can say that Usyk is him in 10 years' time. Yeah. Um, clearly a proven cruiserweight, clearly a great fighter. I mean, I just don't think that he that he's ever going to stand a chance against people that skilled and at that height. Yeah. Um, because they are just too big. And so someone with, especially Fury's skill set and height, I mean, he's going to out, his skill set's kind of up there with anyone else's and will just outreach you. But, I mean, he's not looking, in terms of when we anticipate that he's going to be fighting in world level, uh, at world level, he, I, I, I doubt that he's going to come, uh, come into competition with the Joshua Fury or Wilder. And so the heavyweight scene at that point may be where, I, A, either you don't have individual of the current statue of Fury at 6-7, that they're a bit smaller, mm. um, which will give him a greater chance, or they're <clears throat> individuals of that height, but of a lesser skill set. So then it might be comparable to David Hay, when David Hay fought Nikolai Valiev, who was obviously yeah. had all the height, but clearly the skill set was lower. Mm. So I think it's difficult to predict. If he was coming into fighting at world level at this point, would he have a chance? No, because, because not only are the guys there too big for him, they're too skilled, but he may come... You know, he's, he's predicting who's with, with then predicting who's going to be in the top of five or six years' time, maybe longest, maybe three or four years' time, and there is a chance that the guys who are the champions at that point may have either either be smaller than our current champions, or be uh, less skilled, and that the heavyweight division will be in a place more comparable to when David Hay came through. And then, sure, well, I, I believe his uh, proportions are similar to Hay, right? Yeah. He's, he's same height, 6'2", six, 6'3". Two, six, yeah. 6'2", play 6'3". So then, why wouldn't he have a chance? So, again, it's very difficult to predict. Yeah, I agree. I think, just thinking about him, obviously, if you imagine him even being a lot better than he is right now, just thinking about a fight between him and Fury just seems strange. It seems like they should be different weight classes. 
which I think brings up an interesting point. There has been a little bit of talk about a weight class above cruiserweight but below heavyweight, um, which would obviously fit these kind of guys in. And, I mean, in terms of accolades, I think it helps these kind of guys at that, around that. Like, we were talking about Babich Winters the other day, how they didn't seem like proper heavyweights, but they were, they were a bit big for cruiserweights, that kind of thing. Same with David Adelaide, Usyk, people like that. And, uh, and, yeah, I think it helps in terms of accolades. I think they have a better chance at winning a world title in those weights. But money-wise, those guys want the big money fights. And someone like David Adelaide, he's not going to be fighting um, Joshua White, Wilder, Fury, because I, I think he'll be, they'll be long gone before he gets to that sort of level. Um, or unless he fights one of them on the way out or something. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. What, what do, you think? do you think it's worth having another weight division there? Well, I think the only thing is, is obviously, the Babbage Winters, I understand when you're coming from it, I wouldn't necessarily agree with the example, because I didn't go so I'd say the Winters is a blown up light heavy. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> he shouldn't even be fighting a cruiserweight. Mm-hmm. I think that conceptually it probably makes sense, but I feel like the trade-off has always been that, I mean, at that point, then, what do you, uh, the way I'd phrase it is, what do you gain from adding that weight in? Um, in that the theoretical trade-off, and I know you're not a big fan of Cruiserweight, and I am, but uh, purely because it, my kind of my weight and my height has always put me in the Cruiserweight division, so it's the, what I maintain, maintain interest in, is that uh, a Cruiserweight you, versus Heavyweight, you have the trade-off of Cruisers are your 6'2", 6'3", so a guy that, if you saw out and about, is tall, but he's not super tall, and the trade-off is meant to be that you have increased speed and it's a and then versus heavyweight which is the giants and the real power if you then put something in the middle I think you're kind of getting shit heavyweight mm. like there's, there's going to be no difference you're not going to get people like, looking like, for titles exactly and I understand that people might say theory cruiserweight isn't faster than heavyweight mm. again uh, sorry in, in, in reality but in theory that element is still there and you, you still do get people like Usyk Cruiserweight yeah. still had incredible hand speed, and so I feel like if you put a division in the middle, you're just kind of getting. Uh, I, I don't see where the benefit is because you don't have the attraction in the heavyweight level. You're not watching giants, mm-hmm. um, so the attraction there is lost. But then on the cruiserweight level, you're not watching increased speed. So, um, so it's it's kind of you're losing the benefits of both yeah. heavyweight and cruiserweight. And you're just getting a, sh- a shit heavyweight <laughs> or a fat cruiserweight from the division. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the the. M- historical criticism of the cruiserweight division has always been why don't you fight a heavyweight I mean there's been less of that over the last sort of five six years because you have these sort of super heavyweights these massive guys but yeah that was that always used to be the criticism like why are you fight a cruiserweight just fight a heavyweight like you just don't want to fight the big guys that kind of thing and I think if you bring in this division it just all creates two divisions where that's happening and people are just getting shit for not fighting a heavyweight because that's what that's the division that people want to see them at. Another one of the uh, little stories that's come out of it was Babich. Everyone loved him. Um, Jago in particular. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what, what, what are your thoughts on his future in sport? Well, so I'm very excited for Alan Babich. Uh, <laughs> I don't like how you said it was a little story. I thought that was arguably the emergence of Alan the Savage Babich was even a bigger story than White uh, being knocked out. Um, <laughs> I spent the majority of my night sleepless just at the thoughts of Babbage. <laughs> I think, though, unfortunately, what we've seen, and again, we've seen the mind of Eddie Hearn probably work here, is that Hearn's talked about, because after that fight, Babbage was obviously trending on social media. Uh, I think the figures were three and a half million tweets put out. Um, two and a half of those were mine, but still one, <laughs> one and a half million on, on other people. Um, for anyone that's listening, Jay Lyon and Scott Thomas on Instagram, get involved. But, um, uh, the, the talk is about him elevating to that big level and Hearn has said that he's going to put him through some domestic fights first that he's not ready to fight Hearn with I was about to say is he had, he's had three fights <laughs> but also I mean so obviously clearly it's, it's jumping the gun but what, what we're seeing very clearly from Eddie Hearn the way Hearn's mind is working here is to uh, kind of milk the cash cow mm-hmm. so it makes sense for him to put him on four or five yeah. undercards let him knock people out because I mean he basically beat up a blown up like I said light heavyweight 
And so um, you can't judge any, so it makes sense on a business level to kind of drag it out a little bit before he puts him in because there's a lot of money to be made for this guy. Mm. I mean, you can put him on undercards. As, in, in three or four fights' time, he could be a chief support on the undercard. And if not, he's an exciting... Like, when the guy's trending on Twitter and he was the second fight of the evening, um, you know, he was low down on the card and his name's trending on Twitter. I mean, he's clearly valuable. So it makes sense from a money standpoint with her. As much as I love him, my prediction for him would be, I think the parallel that I would draw is maybe a Kimbo Slice in the UFC. So Kimbo Slice, who uh, built his name up in kind of street fights on Facebook and was had that online community. And Dana White uh, famously was very critical of him and said that the famous line that Dana White, the president of the UFC, kind of trotted out was that Kimbo will always be the toughest guy at a barbecue but will never be an elite level fighter. And the idea being, in terms of pure heart and spirit and in a street fight, will do very well. But when you get into a disciplined professional martial arts, there's going to be people that outskill him. And was then Kimbo Slice was invited on Ultimate Fighter 13 or 14 and got beaten up, in the, you know, went out in the first round and fought in the UFC for like three fights and lost the last two. And, and it was proven, like a very good street fighter, yeah. uh, but in you know, discipline, professional martial arts is very different to fighting yeah, in the street. Yeah, the levels. And, and not even that it's necessarily levels, because I think the hardest guy at the barbecue, Dana White was saying, even if you met one of these guys on the street, you may be able to do damage, but street fighting to professional martial arts is very different. Uh, and I think that's where Babbage, unfortunately, is at, is that, you know, the guy clearly has a load of heart. He's... He, his experience comes not from training, comes from working nightclub doors in Croatia. Um, so he's undoubtedly, yeah, I, I think the parallel is very similar to Kimbo Slice. I, I think that he's going to get found out at this level. And especially in boxing, is arguably, I mean, there's the ground level to UFC, but the, the sweet science of boxing, yeah. I mean, he, he'll get f- found out. So I think, you know, as, as exciting as he is, he's not someone for us to watch. He's someone for us to enjoy on undercards. I think Eddie Hearn will put him on a load of undercards rather than throwing him in the, at the deep end. Because um, from a commercial point of view, that makes sense. And I think we can just enjoy him scrapping and being a street mm-hmm. fighter in the ring. I, I think here yeah, have four or five good victories in undercard. And I think as soon as you put him up against a decent boxer, he'll get found out. Yeah, well, I think Eddie Hearn loves that domestic side to the heavyweight division, doesn't he? He loves sticking it on the undercard because it's just an attraction. I, I reckon we'll see him in with Tom Little, Dave Allen, David Price, just all of them. Maybe Nick Webb. <laughs> just throw him in with all of them. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to see where he goes. Um, but yeah, before we finish, just quickly, Tiafimo Lopez, uh, Lomachenko. What are your predictions for that fight? Obviously, we'll talk about it more in later podcasts because it's not been properly signed yet, but we'll just touch on it now. I think great fight, but how can you look past Lomachenko? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say it is so hard to look past him, but just Teofimo Lopez, the power that he has at that weight and the fact that lightweight is his weight, whereas Lomachenko's come up, I think, two or three weights since from where he started, that just he adds that little aspect of interest where with the last cut, well, when Lomachenko fought Crawler, um, Luke Campbell, because he's been fighting, obviously, in the UK quite a lot recently, and... Uh, and, and then that's sort of the underdog situation. Where like, obviously, Tiafimo Lopez is not the favourite, but I don't know if you can give him underdog status. And I think that's what makes that fight interesting. And then also, another one we'll quickly talk about, was we just touched on Luke Campbell there. He's, he might be fighting Ryan Garcia. Um, obviously, a bit of a social media star, hanging out with all those social media lot in LA. I mean, I'm not a big fan of that, personally. I think you're a bo- if you're a boxer, you should be a boxer. I think... I think it takes a certain personality to be a boxer, and I almost think that you need it. Like, you've seen Tommy Fury come out of Love Island. Before that, he was into his boxing. Now, we saw him what fight once. I would be very surprised if he goes anywhere in boxing, because I don't think he's got that in him anymore. Same with um, all the YouTube boxing with uh, KSI's trainer, Vidal Riley. Um, I, I just think, obviously, I, I've seen a little bit of footage of Vidal Riley, and he looks a good boxer, but it's just... He's now bought, a, he's, he's, sorry, he's not bought, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> you know, he's not bought anything. Um, he's, uh, he's become 
like big on social media. I think he's got like over a million YouTube subscribers, Instagram, all that. I think he makes a bit of music, and it just I, I think you need that desire in boxing that that you need to make your money from boxing to get somewhere. And I think people like that just are gonna struggle. And I think Ryan Garcia is a great talent. He's obviously won some national championships as an amateur in America, all that kind of stuff. But I just think someone like Luke Campbell, he's been in the game so long. He's so well-schooled. He's dealt with much better boxers than, than uh, Ryan Garcia. He obviously went 12 rounds with Lomachenko. And I just think Ryan Garcia is going to get found out. I'll be happily be proved wrong because I think Ryan Garcia could be a great fighter. He's 21 and he's at this level already. He could be a great fighter in the future. Fights with him, Devin Haney, even Lomachenko, Lopez, the lightweight division, uh, Tank Davis. The lightweight division is buzzing at the moment. But I just think this is a step too far for Ryan Garcia at this stage in his career. Maybe he'll come back, but I think Luke Campbell has the experience and the quality to put him away. And he looks chinny. <laughs> so I think it's a very interesting point, the extent to which... My interpretation of it would be that there's a fine line between marketing yourself and getting caught up in the marketing aspect of it. So boxing is one of, actually, I would say is the only professional sport left where you are in control of your own commercial value through being a character. So all martial arts, maybe not boxing, UFC too. But if we look at the UFC, for example, and we draw a parallel, and we say to most European people, who, who's the standout fighter from the UFC? Conor McGregor. Why is that? Because the, the divisions that he fights at in the UFC are not the divisions that you could take a parallel with boxing and the glamour divisions, mm -hmm. the heavyweight. So if we said to people, if we asked people in the UK or Europe about, say, light heavyweights, John Jones, Daniel Cormier, or even the people fighting in the heaviest division, a, a lot of the time, people won't know who they are, even though, comparatively speaking, that should be the glamour division. The reason we know McGregor is because of his marketing, because of the funny talk, the salesman aspect to it. So we have to accept that in martial arts, that's the last remaining sport where if you want a character, an individual, you make people laugh, you engage in antics, um, that that can elevate your earnings and your potential. So there is that aspect to it. But I think there's a fine line between engaging in that to increase your commercial value and knowing that's what you're doing and then getting caught up in the uh, social media, reality TV, celebrity hype. There's a very fine line because it can be a very sensible business decision to build your profile or you can get caught up and lost in it. So the name you brought out there, Reid Riley, I've heard him speak before and he's talked about how it was a conscious decision, decision with him that he was friends with a YouTuber called Alison Gibb who actually fought Jake Paul on the undercard of Matchroom Show in Miami and uh, it was through him that he got the opportunity to fight KSI and that he decided it's a boxing decision to put his um, own career on hold that that was, gave him the opportunity to build his profile and then that would make him a more profitable fighter. And so when you look at that, you can say, actually, in boxing, if you want to make big money, your talent's one part of it, and position, unless you're a heavyweight, where if, obviously if you're the most talented heavyweight, then you are going to become marketable. But in any other division, I would suggest that there are world champions that the majority of casual fans have never heard of, because they've either marketed in themselves correctly or been marketed correctly. So it can be a sensible decision. So for, in my mind, Vidal Riley falls more on the aspect of it being a sensible decision to build his profile. Where I agree, agree with you is, for me, Garcia's falling into, it's not, clearly if anyone who follows so him, is that he, he's not engaging in this because he needs to build his, I mean, his profile was big enough already two years ago. He's now loving the Instagram, posting his abs workout, models for Gymshark, and he's almost now an influencer, which brings him into the Tommy Fury category. So that's where I, I agree with you. I think, I, 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 personally, I mean, you, you say you like to be proven wrong. I'd hate to be proven wrong. I'd love to see Cam do him. Um, and so we can send one of these American influencers, you know, back to their, back home, you know, humble, making him eat humble pie. But I think conceptually it's a very interesting uh, kind of topic about 
the extent to which it's clever and business savvy for uh, martial artists to engage in building their profile. But the fine line that there is between building your profile and getting lost in the hype. And, and the final point on that is just remember, I would have argued, and I think it's proven in terms of revenue generated or net worth, that maybe Bar Anderson Silva, you know, the, the legend of the heaviest division in the UFC, actually, was, no, but the, the legend of UFC, yeah. that Conor McGregor was the, commercially, was the biggest star in the UFC before having even fought for a world title. Yeah. Before he beat Jose Aldo, was the biggest star in the UFC. Yeah. So that is the example of someone clearly that we have to acknowledge there's a marketing and business side of self promotion in martial arts. But there's a very fine line, as I said, and I think conceptually that's an interesting argument is how do you navigate that of building your profile, building your enterprise value or commercial image versus getting lost up in it? Yeah, I think. With, with the whole Conor McGregor, obviously I don't know too much about the UFC, but with the whole Conor McGregor situation, that seemed that his commercial value and his entertainment value came from his involvement with the UFC, as in him chatting shit to other fighters and, and doing all this crazy stuff at press conferences. Ryan Garcia seems like he's just got so caught up in this celebrity life. He's in LA with all these YouTubers and sort of being in their videos and getting paparazzi and all that kind of rubbish. And I just think, I also want to make clear, when I said I'd love to be proved wrong, I do want Luke Campbell to win this fight. I, uh, I think he really deserves it. I think he's fought a high level for so long. And, uh, and I'd love to see him win a world title. I think he dispatches Ryan Garcia and, and Devin Haney and gets that WBC world title. It's slightly frustrating that they kind of ruined it in that division with the whole franchise thing, um, because it will put like a little bit of a a pin in, his, in, in him winning WBC world title if he does do it. Um, what I meant by being proved wrong is that if Ryan Garcia does beat Luke Campbell at this age, then he will go on to do great things. That will prove he's a great fighter because Luke Campbell has proved that he's a world-class fighter. He just hasn't quite had that edge. I feel bad for him that originally it was obviously called with Javier Fortuna and I thought that was, a, that was an obvious win for Luke Campbell. Um, and now it's obviously WBC, you know what they're like, you can change their minds every five minutes. But um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say that's all we've got to talk about today on the Boxing Index podcast. It's gone slightly longer today. Um, any any uh, parting thoughts, Jago? Make sure to follow the uh, socials, Jago underscore Thomas. Other than that, if anyone is still listening at this point, please <laughs> inbox me on that social. Let me know that we still do have active listeners. <laughs> Because otherwise, probably what we do next time is uh, we do the first 20 minutes really seriously. <laughs> we, we want to establish where people stop listening. Um, so if you ask me... Yeah, com- comment where you stop listening. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you're still listening at this point, inbox us both on uh, social media and we will actually invest in a prize for you. Yeah, and let's hopefully get... Uh, last time I think we and Jago came on, we hit 550, which was a record for the Boxing Index views-wise. So let's try and hit 750 on this one. And, uh, yeah, like it if you did like it, and subscribe if you want to subscribe. Um, Yeah, go check out our most recent articles on theboxingindex.co.uk and follow us at Boxing Index on whatever social medias. And, yeah, thanks for listening. Cheers. Bye.